Okay, thank you for coming. I really appreciate the, the crowd with us this morning. I am Kathy Zook. I am the ARC Program Manager for Eastgate Regional Council of Governments. And we're really excited to have what I call the A team here from the Governor's Office of Appalachia to talk with us today about the historic $500 million investment that our Ohio legislature and Governor DeWine signed in June. That is the Appalachian Community Grant Program. And I know all of you have an interest in that. So we are we're going to talk today about how we can uh, partner together for regional transformational projects. And definitely we're focusing on planning. So I would like to begin by thanking Eastern Gateway Community College for hosting us here. Um, we are hoping that they, we don't have any technical issues. We have the microphone up here. So for the folks in the audience, we do have a virtual audience with us as well. If you ask a question, uh, they may not be able to hear you. So we're going to repeat the question. All of you have note cards on your seats. Please uh, feel free to write your questions there. We're gonna have a question and answer segment and we want to hear what your questions and concerns are. Uh, and then also I wanna let you know some housekeeping issues. The restrooms are down the hall and to the right. We're really excited to bring this opportunity forward. And this time, I'd like to introduce Art Bailey of Eastern Gateway Community College. He is the Senior Vice President and Chief Development Officer. I can't say it's in the friends here. It's an honor to have you here at our campus today. Um, a once in a lifetime opportunity of, of having funding to sort of transform our entire region. Um, it's great to have everyone here. I can't thank Eastgate, Kathy, Jim, and his team for allowing us to host this wonderful event. Uh, we thank you very much. And uh, we also want to introduce um, President Michael Gagan of Eastern Gateway Community College to say a few words as well. Thank you, all right, and welcome. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, the President of Eastern Gateway Community College in one of our buildings here in Youngstown purchase in 2020, but we're in four counties. We're in kind of the heart of Appalachia. So we go south to uh, we north to Trumbull, Mahoney, Columbia, and Jefferson. So we are really excited about this initiative. It's, it, it, and I think the key word here is transformative. I want to thank the governor for bringing this forward, uh, Director Carey and his team for uh, implementing the, uh, the regulation. So it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for the region. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Kathy and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. President. I'd like to begin by thanking, of course, the Eastgate team because, of course, it, it does take a team to put this together. We have our executive director, Jim Kinnick, here in the front, Stephanie Dyer, Justin Mondock. And Joanne Adenwine at, at the front desk, and they have been a great support and a team effort in putting this together. So now, the meat and potatoes of why you're here is to find out how we can get a piece of that $500 million so we can capture all that we can for our, our district. And just to refresh, our district is Trumbull, Mahoney, and Ashtabula County for, uh, as a local development district. That's what our region covers for each. So I'm introducing first, we have Austin Ward, and he is the program administrator at the Governor's Office of Appalachia. And we have Julia Hinton, who is the chief of staff. And then, of course, Director John Carey, appointed by Governor DeWine, and Madison Knight, who keeps us all together as our administrator. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Director Carey. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, each of you, for being here today. Uh, it's been a great privilege. It's always great to be in the Mahoney Valley and to be at Eastgate. I want to thank uh, Jim and Kathy and the entire team for uh, putting this together in such short notice. And it's always uh, great to be at Eastern Gateway. I've, uh, long, I was back when uh, President Meeks was here. I think I told this one was still a parking garage. <laughs> So to come back and see the progress that's made is really great. And your president is a person that I've worked with for a long time. 
and I really respect it, Moyer. And it's a real privilege for me to be in Thomas Humphreys Hall because Thomas Humphreys was the chairman of the Board of Regents when I was the Department of Fire Education. I've never worked with a finer person or a person who represented not only our, the Board of Regents well, but Mahoney Valley. So if you see him come, I'll take your brief think about him. I'm sorry I didn't get to see him this time. Um, I do want to thank uh, Pat Lowry from Congressman Ryan's office. Everybody probably knows you, but thank you for being here. Uh, Representative LaCour Hagen, I think, was coming. Does she have a representative here? Maybe she'll be here a little later. And um, we really want to thank all the legislature for their support and their help. We've had bipartisan support on the Appalachian Community Grant Program. When uh, Governor DeWine invited me to uh, Pointed me to this uh, position as director of the governor's office of Appalachia. One of the first things he did was invited me to present to the cabinet. And he told the cabinet members that uh, their job is to work with us to make Appalachia better, to do great things. If you look at our resources page, which Austin will share later, you'll see all the state agencies that are involved with this. But it's not just the state agencies, it's great partners like uh, Eastgate and um, several others, both public and private, that will make this uh, program a success. We all feel a lot of responsibility because uh, this is a great opportunity. So there's two things to remember to start off with. Uh, these are ARPA funds, America Rescue Plan Act funds. So the, fund, the project has to be ARPA eligible. So there will be guidelines posted uh, on our website Austin will talk more, more about these details, and uh, Julia, that will tell you what's ARPA eligible. But just because it's ARPA eligible doesn't mean it fits into House Bill 377, the legislation that the House passed. So it has to be ARPA eligible <clears throat> and compliant with House Bill 377. When our office uh, worked on the guidelines, uh, they tried to hold as true as they could to the law, but at the same time, adding flexibility. I'd encourage you to take advantage of your local development district, take advantage of Eastgate. I know we have at least one other person here that's from Omega. So um, take advantage of those resources. They're mm -hmm. no cost to you. Um, we do have Jay Bennett that's contracted. Stand up and wave there, Jay in the back. Jay mm -hmm. is uh, contracted to with Eastgate and Omega to work on projects that will be kind to uh, navigate What's eligible and not eligible? We have a lot of different funding sources. We have a local development district basic funding that we have that you're more maybe more accustomed to. We have power for poor impacted communities. Kathy just told me all the construction that's going on around the building is a power project. So that's good construction. Uh, we have uh, Inspire, which Flying High, for example, has received funding for. Is for people that are in recovery work. And we now have us fired, which is, uh, we do, don't ask us what any of these letters stand for. We don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe Julia knows. Aspire is multi state ARC project. So even if for some reason the project does not fit in this 500 million, we still want to know about the project because we may have, may have other funding that fits better and maybe, to be honest, less competitive. So um, as Kathy mentioned, you would write your questions down during the presentation and pass them to the end and Kathy and Madison will collect them and then I'll ask. I always take the questions so I answer the easy ones and I give the hard ones to Julia and Austin. So uh, I think that's all I need to cover before I introduce Julia. Uh, Michael Kehoe is here from Lieutenant Governor's office. Thank Wait. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Michael, um, we were in shock then. This is, I don't remember what month it was, maybe August or maybe August. He goes, when are you going to get those guidelines out? <laughs> so I'm um, glad he's here so you can hear that we got the guidelines out. <laughs> All right, Julie, I'll turn it over to you. Morning, everyone. I hope it's okay. I am going to read a little bit because I do not want to miss any of these points. I think it's very important that I hit all of these. Austin's probably going to do a little bit of the same, um, but we are looking forward to your questions and we'll have the opportunity at that point to, to answer more. Um, 
So I'm going to start with the funding priorities. And the goal, of course, of this program is transformational change. So to achieve that, we've selected areas in which the project have the most impact in their communities. Downtown infrastructure, health care, and workforce. Infrastructure is downtown redevelopment and transformational Main Street change. It could also be trails and projects like that. Infrastructure, however, though, is not constructing roads or bridges or water or sewer projects or broadband. These can be portions of other larger projects that fall into any of these categories. Healthcare, it can be a school-based clinic, expanding or establishing farmers markets in your downtown. Workforce is funding and establishing training programs that work for your residents in your community. There's no one size fits all for, for this program. We intended it to be that way because there is no one size fits all in our region. Every community and county is unique, and we want you to work on projects that work for you. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about eligibility. And let's first start with who's eligible to apply. We've been encouraging communities to work together to create regionally diverse transformational projects. So how do those partnerships work and who actually can apply? <coughs> so each application must have one eligible lead applicant. Eligible lead applicants must be a local unit of government or a government related entity. That includes townships, villages, cities, port authorities, county governments, and council of governments, such as Eastgate. Educational institutions and nonprofits are also eligible lead applicants, but they must have documented support from the local unit of the government where the project is located. This could be a letter of support of a memorandum understanding and it must be documented within the grant application. The lead applicant does not have to be located within our 32 county Appalachian region. However, they must have previously established operations and the project must be exclusively within the 32 county Appalachian region. For applications that have more than one eligible unit or government or other partners, Project must determine a lead applicant to serve as the primary applicant. The lead applicants are the single point of contact and fiscal agent for the project application. They're responsible for distributing funds to project partners and ensuring project compliance. We've been working very closely with OBM. We will be reporting back to the federal government since these are our dollars. For-profit entities and state-based county agencies are eligible partners for the program, but again, they must establish a subrecipient agreement or MOU with the eligible lead applicant. <coughs> Next, I'm going to talk about the availability of funding. So there's nearly $500 million available in total. Funding is available to projects, again, only in the 32 county Appalachian region, which is defined by ARC, or the Appalachian Again, applying entities do not have to be fully located within the region, but the project activities must be exclusively within the 32 county region. There are two types of funding, planning and development. So first, we're going to talk about planning. It's available in two ways. The first is community planners. One use of our planning funding would be utilized to procure planning professionals. The creation of this program, we heard that many communities struggle with capacity to complete applications and plan large projects. So to help communities do this, we are utilizing the Appalachian Planning Grants to provide community planners to help with the development and coordination of projects. The Department of Development currently has a request for proposals out to procure these planners. It's available on our program website. Planners are not available yet, more information will be available after the first round of grants have been awarded around early 2023. Communities do not need to apply for these planners, uh, but the planning professionals will be free and available to all Appalachian communities and projects. Planners will serve as the main planning entity for development grant projects. You do not need to procure your own planning entity. Planners will be available through the life of the program to assist with project planning and applications. 
Planners can't be lead applicants, but they can help with applications. Applications will be available in multiple rounds. In the first round, concurrent with the Appalachian Technical Assistance Grant, 50 million will be available um, for development grants. For all rounds, projects must be completed by August 31st, 2026. There will be no extensions or projects unless the federal government extends the ARPA deadline. That's just kind of out of our hands at this time. Applications will open tomorrow, November 2nd. There is no set time for the application to go live. Our team will work to get the application online and then we'll link it on our webpage. And then we will notify you by the email list uh, when it is live. Are most of you on our email list? not had an opportunity to do that, be sure to go to our web page and link up to our email um, look through that. Applications for both technical assistance and development grants are due December 9th at 5 p.m. Late applications will not be accepted, so please ensure that you've correctly submitted your application by that time. Now, Austin Ward. Thanks, Julia. I'll be sharing more about the resources that are available to your communities to help make stronger projects and give you a better chance of being funded. The first of those resources is your local development district. So um, you guys are all here today. So I assume you have at least some relationship with Eastgate. Um, they do a lot of great things for us, as Director Perry mentioned, and are playing a, play a vital role in our Appalachian Regional Commission dollars and a lot of other newer programs that have popped up over the last couple of years. So we rely a lot on them for help on the ground and help helping us get the word out and organizing everything and uh, being an extension of our office in the region. That being said, Eastgate and other local development districts can serve as lead applicants for project applications. We encourage anyone interested in submitting an application to connect with your local with your local development district beforehand. Now, as far as the web page goes, that that director Kerry mentioned, um, we have a resources page on there with lots of programs from other state agencies and other sources that you might want to look into for research or information or data or uh, other programs funding opportunities. We have. Uh, as Director Gary mentioned, other state agencies that have specific programs that might fund a particular part of some of the stuff that you're looking for that might be a better fit or could complement our program. You do not have to utilize any of these other programs, but you will have a stronger application if you do so. A couple of other things I want to highlight that are on the web page projects must be ARPA eligible and align with the legislation laid out in House Bill 377. Links to both of those are on the web page. We encourage you to reference these as you go about planning your projects and submitting your applications. The final topic I want to talk about is the scoring of applications. Projects are not first come, first served and will be scored competitively. We have posted the rubrics for both grants on the web page. Please use these rubrics as a guide when completing your application. They will tell you exactly what we're looking for and how you will be scored. For example, when deciding the components included in your project, consider the score assigned to each. You do not have to have a project that includes community development infrastructure, healthcare, and workforce, but you will score stronger if you do so. When you're including your partnerships, not only are we looking for the quantity of partnerships, but more importantly, the quality of those partnerships and what specifically each of those partners will be doing. Make sure you are detailing in your application what each partner brings to the table and what their role will be. We've said it before, we want communities to focus on planning. Create your plans with these scoring rubrics in mind. If you are applying for technical assistance grants, those will be competitive, but we understand that you are still early in your planning phase. For that reason, scoring is much more lenient than for development grants. The technical assistance grant is an opportunity to get funding to explore possibilities for your development. Again, the technical assistance grant 
does not have to match the development grant that you will submit later. There might be some activities that you included in the technical assistance grant that you find might not fit to include in the development grant and vice versa. Again, not everyone will, will need a technical assistance grant. And with that in mind, we will have procured planners available to you free of use, whether or not you choose to apply for a technical assistance grant. A final note I will mention is on the budget section of the Spring River. You may notice that we've allocated quite a bit of points to this section. We've said it before, but $500 million is a lot for my is a lot of money for Appalachia. We want to handle these funds responsibly, and we know that you expect the same. You will score higher if you can show that you have the capacity for managing your project and the funds, and you demonstrate that to us in these narratives. As far as other funding sources, you will score higher if you're utilizing other programs. These, these awards don't necessarily have to be granted yet, but if you're applying for grants and funding, uh, through other opportunities, you are going to score higher because we know that you're taking your partnerships and your projects seriously. It does not necessarily matter if these other funding sources are 5,000 or 5 million. <clears throat> the amount is going to score similarly. It's more about the number and quality of partnerships that matters. I'll turn it back to the. What's that? Yeah, yeah. So I apologize. I do not do well when I'm flipping papers and I don't have something to put it down. So I just want to make sure that I clarify a couple more things about the technical system screen. So sorry, <laughs> a little little off uh, our our game today. Sorry. I think it was probably the late Browns Bengals game. <laughs> Um, okay, for the technical assistance grants, which that is the second type of funding. We have planners that we're procuring, but then we have technical assistance grants. And um, communities can apply for these technical assistance grants, but they do not have to apply to receive a technical assistance grant to then apply for the development grant. Um, technical assistance can be used for administrative costs, preliminary engine costs, legal costs, and more. If communities don't want to use our procured planners or no cleaning expenses, they can apply for technical assistance grants. There's going to be 250,000 available per county. Funds are not given for any county and not reserved for any single entity. Communities must submit applications and technical assistance funds will be competitive. Any communities looking to be a part of a project can apply but we, we are encouraging communities to partner and develop the lead applicant. The projects with multiple counties or lead applicants that serve multiple counties can split their requests between each county involved. Technical assistance grants are only going to be available during the first round. After that, any planning funding will not, that is not utilized will go back to our general pot of funds and be used for development projects in that round. Okay, so the second type of funding is the development grants, and those are the ones that are for the big transformational projects that we've been talking about. Just FYI, there's no funding cap on what you can request an application, but there is a $1 million minimum to ensure that communities are thinking big and projects are transformational in scope. I think I covered pretty much everything else. But just wanted to, that was important information. <laughs> Okay, uh, this time Madison and Kathy will pick up your questions. We'll pass them to the end of the, the aisle. And um, a couple of things. I do have, did get a question uh, uh, that I can answer with as it wasn't on a card. Can the uh, project cross local development district lines? And for example, uh, can East, somebody in Columbiana County work with Eastgate in the Eastgate region for a project? And they can. So you want to actually think bigger than your LDD because the, the LDD lines don't really make any difference as far as a green project because they're all in Appalachia. We're going to work with your LDDs, but uh, our LDDs work very closely together. Kathy's on the Kathy and her counterparts. Uh, meet very frequently and we can solve on projects. So don't let um, the county, the LD lines, uh, 
stymie any projects is are certainly welcome. Okay. <laughs> well, were projects partially funded or only all or nothing? Uh, yes. So, um, projects, uh, we, we've created the application in a way that when you list all project activities, if there are some that are not eligible or that we will not be able to fund, we're going to be able to go in and deselect those activities and still allow the full mm -hmm. grant to go in. So it won't affect your application if there's parts and pieces that maybe won't be eligible. Okay. Uh, thank you, Julia. Can an OD, OD, can development procure planner also be hired by an eligible applicant who received T, TA funding to work on a plan? Yes, you can, you can use both the technical assistance grant funding and use a procured planner. Um, we realize that there's a lot of communities that like just need the administrative staff to even get them to the table to use our procured planners. Um, so we're expecting that there'll be multiple uh, communities that need to use both. Um, and I think, just to clarify, the planners at development will not, you will not have to pay them. Those are, those are being paid by the Department of Development. Uh, is 22 million for the, of the plan grants being reserved to the development procure planners? Are procure planners available after round one? So, yeah, you can you can help answer that, but a, a portion of that is being used for the procured planners, but um, we're expecting not to use all of that. So we're expecting the funding to go back um, potentially for the development grants. Yeah, when uh, you might remember when the governor announced uh, this program back in April, originally it was 50 million for planning and in talks with the legislature, they thought that was too much money and it was, um, so through the legislative process, they appropriated 30 million for planning, given Director Mahalik uh, initially 15 million, uh, which the county funds will come out of and the procured planners will come out at $15 million. And then the, the uh, director has the ability to go back and ask for more money if we see there's a pressing need for that. And all, all of our projects and spending has to be approved by the state control. Um, what is the advantage of applying for TA funding and using uh, development planners? Um, I think that even though there's a lot of potential projects that may think they're ready to move forward, um, you know, this transformational change covers more than just your county. So taking advantage of the planners and the technical assistance in our local development districts will only benefit your project. Um, so I, I highly encourage you take the time to do that um, because you may find that there are other communities that um, are maybe looking to do the same thing and your application would be um, score higher because you're including more than just you normally would. I was asking what the code word would be So I don't think that there's necessarily an advantage and you may not need to use that technical assistance funding. It's not going to affect you for the development round. Um, so it, it's really just there for those communities that need those extra resources to kind of just get to the starting line. That's how I see it. The procure planners may not necessarily be doing the exact same work that you might have people do for the technical assistance grant. Procured planners will be taking more of a regional look and seeing what projects might work well together or what's working here versus there and um, how they might find some synergies, examples like that. The technical assistance grant is more on the ground specific to your project. Uh, like I said, some of the activities might overlap, but they don't necessarily um, have to. Can you give an example of a project that would be considered ready for implementation? This refers to the 90 day. Yeah, so the the guidelines read shovel ready, and that means shovel ready. That means you're ready to break ground. You're ready to, you've got everything lined up. All your preliminary work is done. Construction's 
ready to go within 90 days of being awarded. Um, so that 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 is going to be kind of a struggle for some projects, which is why the next round, which will be the following October, um, might be a better avenue for most because the shovel ready is not kind of as extreme as it is for this first round. Um, can partnerships with lead eligible entity include a for-profit company? Yes, partners can be for profit, and that's actually public-private partnerships are definitely something that we encourage for this. It's actually part of the law. Yeah. What are your thoughts on using the ACGP, the Appalachian Community Grant Program, technical assistance grants to fund a multi-municipal bike trail along the Mahoney River corridor for spurs in the surrounding areas? Very specific question. That's a very specific <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, my thoughts are that sounds like, um, I'm not sure you'd want just a technical assistance grant. It looks like you're maybe looking for more of an implementation grant. Um, and there's plenty of partners, I think, around the table to help with that piece. Um, so use our procured planners and, um, um, I, I'm excited to see what comes from that. I've, I've heard a little bit, so. You got the Austin, you Austin, you kayak that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we said Austin do come back to <laughs> Austin, I'll ask you this one. Is there a limit to the number of applications from each county for round one funding? Uh, there is no hard limit. Um, I will make sure we separate the technical assistance grants from the development grants here. But the technical assistance grants, there will be two hundred up to two hundred fifty thousand available within each geographical county that won't necessarily be going to the county government uh, there could be multiple entities from that county applying for that two hundred and fifty thousand. so in an ideal world everybody would be on the same page and know what portion of that two hundred fifty thousand that they want um, but if you are let's say a multi-county organization or someone who is not necessarily one in one step with the local officials you will want to get their support to use some of their uh, allocation for that county that that you're using uh, for the development applications obviously that's a little bit different there's no the only limits for the development applications are that there's only 50 million available in round one and that the minimum is a million other than that you'll just want to think about how your project would be scored if there are for example if you get 20 applications from one county we would obviously have a lot of questions about how many partnerships there really are and who's really working together if there's that much going on so try to think of a way to bring those activities together and see how they can complement each other. I, I think the planners can help with that process as well. They can kind of help you figure out what else is going on within your county and what might be the best outlet to apply. Julia, are administrative funds available to lead applicants? There are administra administrative costs are covered um, through the technical assistance grant. And then I think also um, for the development grant, there's, is it 3%? Yes. Yes. 3% um, of the total costs are avail available for administrative as well. And it's higher for the technical assistance grant. It's 10% for the technical assistance grant, 3% for the development grant. It's, that's outlined in the law. So just want to make you know that we're just not making this stuff up. Um, how closely linked must projects from each category? Um, okay. How closely linked must projects from each category be in order to be combined in a single application versus applying separately, Austin? I think a good way to approach that is a it's a collection of projects. So as long as you have a general spirit of a connection between your activities, um, we're not going to be going through these applications with a big red pen saying we don't think those are those are connected or that these things have something in common so uh, we will we we would much rather you work together and, and combine a lot of those projects and activities uh, together than submit like i said submit several applications each for small projects julia when will planners be available how many will we have time to work with them before round two so the planners are currently, we're procuring those right now. So they will not be available until early, probably January, 2023. And we will not tell you who 
you can use. You um, will have the opportunity to choose, and there'll be multiple planners available, um, multiple entities available uh, for for your use. So, yeah, the RFP for planners is on our website right now. So, if someone happens to be in that field, yeah. So, if you know anyone that maybe would prefer to kind of fill that role in your community and in the area and the region, encourage them to go on to our website and apply for the procurement RFP. Um, how is improvement defined in, in relation to multi-purpose trails? And as a follow-up to that, can you use funds for a bridge for multi-purpose trail? Yes. Yes, you can. So construction projects uh, like that are eligible. Um, I guess I didn't understand the first part of the question. I guess generally, I, generally improvements. My question. So how do you find improvements in multi-purpose trail? Can you repave that trail? Can you redo a bridge on that trail? Like I, that was my main question. Yes and yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any any any, you know, that would be a transformational change if you're, you know, improving and, and making it more usable for a healthy community, um, that that would be eligible. So you probably want to do something new. You don't want to, you don't want to do just routine maintenance. Yeah, right, but you want to yeah, expand yeah. upon. Yeah. And also keep in mind, sustainability will be looked at. If you look at the rubric, you'll see there's a section on sustainability. Um, so you're going to want to have that plan kind of in place as you're going through it. I think Austin asked this, but I'm going to ask it again just so we can reiterate it. Um, would it be best to put several projects together on an application, even if there is no obvious tie between them? Yes. If we apply for planning funds, does that have to draw from the 250000 county allocation, or is it separate, not draw from the county allocation? Unless you're actually applying to become one of our procured planners, um, it will come from the 250000 And our application, you'll see when it goes live tomorrow, um, we've created it in a way that if you select multiple counties that you'll be planning with or using technical assistance grants with, you'll be able to select um, how much from each county you would like to, um, to, to choose. So we'll be monitoring that, but we are capping at 250. Yeah, and just to clarify, the planners at development procures are no cost. So with the 250000 that you're doing locally for technical assistance, where you're hiring grant writer, need some engineering, or whatever the eligible purpose is, that would come out of your 250000 Workforce development projects. For apps that request funding for program and curriculum development, is there some way we need to restrict students, learners as residents in 32 counties? True for online training as well. No, I, I don't believe so. I think we're, we'll be looking more closely to see that it's a locally driven program, that it's um, connected to the businesses that need the workers in your community, not necessarily um, those workers have to be from the 32. We, we want to bring people into the region. We want to bring people back. So that wouldn't be something we would be looking at. So the first question you saw me skip, I don't want to put people on the spot, but it was how many people here plan on going after technical assistance grants versus development grants? So I'm not going to put people in that situation <laughs> to ask that, but you're welcome to self-identify after the <laughs> You're asking us to collaborate on those. Yeah. And, and this is where working with Eastgate is going to benefit you as well, because they're going to be a great resource to let you know. I mean, Kathy's fabulous at figuring out what's already kind of got momentum in the community. So um, take advantage of, of the local development districts for that reason. If I could just add to that, I, I know many of you have um, reached out to Eastgate, and I thank you for that. I know we've had conversations that a lot of the pro or some of the projects I said seemed like a standalone project. So this is your opportunity to group together and to more regionalize your plan. Because as we've heard, 
the projects do not have to be related, nor do they have to be contiguous. So as long as we're hitting the benchmarks for House Bill 377, then your project could be part of a larger ask. So that's what we're encouraging. Please don't go on your own as an independent project group together because our strength mm -hmm. is in our, our numbers for regional and transformational. Yes. So how do we know, how do we know who Well, I would encourage you to contact Eastgate. We have a running tally of those who have expressed an interest. Uh, and we're talking about uh, putting together a, a large technical assistance grant. I think you may know of our River of Opportunity application. So that, that's, that'll be one of the big ones we're looking coming for. Uh, you know, that's involving the two counties and five cities and municipalities along the river stretch there for downtown revitalization. Now that can include access to um, parks, recreation, workforce development, because as Julia said, we want to make Appalachia a place to live and work and for people to come to and visit. So if you have a project that you're thinking of, if you haven't contacted us, please do. So we can hopefully uh, include that in a larger partnership. Sir, to help you. Thank you. Okay. What's the deadline for round two? Okay, so the application should open up around um, October, very first of November of 2023. They would also be due first of December. Um, and again, all applications would need to be completed by October. 31st, 2026. So you have to keep that in mind. Unfortunately, that's not something that we can change. And I'm not expecting the federal government to change it. It'd be great if they would, but we're just not expecting that. So that is something you're going to have to keep in mind when you are thinking about what types of projects. Um, is it something that you can get completed by 2026? Must there only be one lead applicant in the application process? Uh, yes, we... We have one eligible lead applicant. Remember, there's just, you're looking at the office of Appalachia right now. Um, so we're a small staff, um, so one lead applicant, but you will have the opportunity within your application to list other partners and contacts. Um, that is a section of the application. So if you have multiple people that are working on it, um, we would be able to get in touch with them as well. Does it hurt us if there are multiple applicants? Not necessarily, you might want to help with this too. Um, no, because um, it, it may be you find out about a project um, through a different, through the pl procured planners, you have uh, potentially a theater or a project like that that you're wanting to do. Um, you should be able to apply with your county, with your local development district, but then if your community also wants to participate with a larger 32, you know, theater trail type project, that won't affect your score. That, that to me is still being seen as you're working with partners. You're hitting all of the milestones that we're looking for. Can we do projects in phases? If parts of our project are shovel ready and others still need to be designed, what would we prefer to do for the cement? So the answer to that is no. Um, if you have a project that is phased, you have a portion of the project that is ready to go now, do not apply for that this round. It could affect your phased portions the next round. So we would prefer that you take this time to do a little more planning and have the second phase of the project ready to go as well, and then put the full application in next October. And... Uh... I'll take this question is what is the nature of a procurement planner? You can help me out, Julia. Are they full-time employees of your office? Are the existing consultants who are making themselves available in this grant project? Are they paid from this 500 million or from one fund? So Director Mahalik and visiting lots of local officials uh, through the region. One of the barriers that we heard, uh, especially from small towns, was they didn't feel they could procure planners on their own. So Director Mahalik 
uh, came up with the idea of development procurement planners. So they're not employees of the Department of Development or existing consultants. We have a competitive RFP that follows the RFP process. So those that are qualified, we selected from those uh, who apply. You know, are they paid from 500 million or one funds? They are paid from 500 million. So that's one of the reasons why uh, the legislature wanted to start out with 15 million because the other money that we don't spend on planning will go directly into projects. Go over here and get that online. <laughs> So there's way more than what I might be able to share with you. Um, procurement is a requirement of the ARPA dollars. Um, you can get in touch with us and check the compliance portion of that for more information. And also the LDD will be able to provide more information. I, I don't want to kind of jump into that right now without legal uh, speak in front of me. So. This is a unique question that we have not received in any of our board uh, information sessions, so this is good. Can the funding be used for truck, rail, water, and intermodal terminal? Potentially, yes. Yes, I, I would love to see more details around that, um, but I, I, I can't think of anything offhand that would keep it from I would encourage everyone to read the ARPA final rule document. I have a summary of that on the resource page. And that's the final rule summary, and it's 140 pages. So if you, if you want specific details, you'll probably have to find it in there. So we, so we are reporting back to um, OVM and the federal government. And one of the ways that we're trying to include that, we tried to make the application a little bit easier than the ARC application that we um, currently have. And it, it's through Salesforce. So if you've attended Kathy's um, training, you've kind of got a glimpse of what the application will sort of look like because it's set up very similar to our allocated dollars through Escape. Um, but when you go in, you, you select the type of activities, what category they would fall in for L ARPA eligibility. And then what based on what you select for that, that will automatically pull up um, performance measures that you would want to tie your grant to. So um, it's kind of a, a self, um, self select method. You don't have to come up with that information on your own, but you do need to fall into the categories. They're very large scale kind of categories, um, but we tried to make it a little bit easier so that it's kind of a drop down menu. Um, this is kind of a repeat question, but people don't know what other questions people are asking. So it's good to reiterate. Can the funds be used for land acquisition that would lead to dam removal and elevated bike and walking trails? Yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for all your questions. I'm going to turn it back to Kathy in a minute, but I just want to stress to use the resources that you have available <coughs> at East KJ is a great uh, person if you're writing a grant. He can review it. He's worked uh, in that field for a long time. We utilized him with our power grants. He does a great job. Um, if you worked with uh, Kathy and Eastgate before on our other development, on our other grant projects, we're not a got you type agency. We want you to be to get the best application you can. If you put something in that's not eligible, uh, Julia and Austin have the right to contact you and remove it. So. Um, as long as you follow the guidelines and try to uh, uh, follow what we post on our website, uh, your application should be good. So I just encourage you not to have a lot of anxiety about it, but to uh, take advantage of the resources. There's questions that you might ask that we might not know. We would have to do some further research. So it's something that we're all doing together. And we look for, uh, forward to great applications from this, this crowd in this region. I, I just want to comment, and you covered it, John. 
we're here to help at Eastgate. Uh, there's a diverse group here coming from different parts of our region. Please share it. If you want to share your project, we'll gladly start posting the projects, start posting the contacts so that you can find it and, and try to pair up. We'll try to work uh, with each other and try to help you pair up and be part of a bigger project. If this isn't a gotcha, we're trying to get as much funding as we can for the area. So we're here to help. But uh, I realize that everybody in the room knows what everybody else is doing, but we're going to be open as we can and transparent as we can about what everybody's doing, what uh, Eastgate might put in for. So I think we kind of touched on that, but we'd love to be partners with everybody in the room on a bigger project if we can. So I just had one question, and I appreciate your team coming up here, taking the time to talk to us. And, a great part of it. I think John's been up here, I want to say five or six times the last couple of weeks with Julie and Austin. Austin uh, kayaked on the river with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they're always there to help us, and we appreciate that. Uh, Julie, I did one question. I get to write it. When you say uh, construction has to be completed by end of 2026, is that physical construction or is that construction funds allocated for the project by end of 2026? So we have to have the... Um, <laughs> We have to have the invoices and the payments completed. Oh, we think physical construction completed. And I do believe you're a reimbursement. It's not allocating money out for projects. So, so the it, it's not necessarily a 100% reimbursement process. We don't have that finalized yet, but we will be able to kind of upfront pay some costs because these are large scale projects. We know that you're not going to be able to reimburse, you know, uh, 25 million. Uh, and that's, tomorrow, that's you know. as most people know, that's aggressive too. Yes. Yeah, the 2026. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's something I wish we could change, um, but unfortunately we can't because it is ARPA dollars. So. Thank you, Kathy. I'll turn back to you. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much. I think you can see why I call these guys the A. They are <laughs> devoted and dedicated, and they are a pleasure to work with every day. I am thankful for working with them. So I would like to say that please use Eastgate as a resource. If you have um, the opportunity, if you haven't already, go on our website, eastgatecog.org, because we are going to we already have the guidelines on there and all the information that you heard today. You can see it, you can print it, you can review it. This uh, session has been recorded, so we'll have it available for you. And as Jim mentioned, we're going to be posting. Uh, the projects that are, are coming to our attention, giving you more opportunities for a partnership. So I want to thank you for your attention today and for your interest in the program. And our goal is to capture as many project dollars as we can to improve our region, regional transformational, and obviously we're going to focus on planning. Um, and thank you very much. We have cookies, water, and I see a question. Yes. Uh, from the previous webinar that was held last week, I was on that webinar. I thought it was very uh, informative, and I know that the slides themselves are they available for anybody who wasn't available on the webinar. I know the webinar is um, on our website now, so the slides you should at least be able to pull it from that. But we might be able to post the slides yeah, separate. It's something that was really you could sit there and really grasp because it is it's a lot of information. We'll also provide that link when available on the Eastgate website as well. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, we have applicants in the uh, Buckeye Hill district and the Omega district. Anybody from those districts that like to talk to them? All right, then. Thank you very much. Please take this opportunity to network. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, director. Thanks. Good. I'm glad I was just trying to get these done. Michael.